Hi my pretties, hope you're all doing well and welcome back to the only channel where we discuss sketchy stories while sketching. Today's story is actually one I thought about covering when I first started my channel last year because it involves a fugitive who has been on the run for decades and that means I get to do my very favorite thing which is forensic art. For those new to the channel, I am a former lawyer and a trained forensic artist, so I really enjoy combining those two fields of knowledge here on this channel. Today we're talking about Sharon Kinney, and I have to thank Bailey Sarian for reminding me of this case because she covered it a few weeks ago, I believe. And today I'll be sketching an age-progressed sketch of what Sharon might look like today. Sharon Kinney was born on November the 30th, 1939, in Missouri. Is it Missouri or Missouri? I never know. Tell me in the comments. Anyway, she was born in a small town called Independence. And ironically, Sharon felt anything but independent. She wanted to live literally anywhere else. She actually got a taste of the life she wanted when her family briefly moved to Washington State when she was in high school. But sadly for Sharon, they ended up moving back to Independence not long thereafter. When Sharon was 16, she met a 22-year-old engineering student named James Kinney at a church event. A bit of a dodgy age gap, but anyway. They dated for some time, but it seems like it was more of a summer fling in his mind, because he went back to university and their relationship kind of fizzled. That is, until Sharon wrote him a letter and said, Hey, hope you're good. By the way, got a bun in the oven and you're the father. Okay, bye. I'm paraphrasing, of course. And James was a Mormon, so premarital <coughs> was a big no-no. So James rushed back and married Sharon. On the marriage license, Sharon's age was incorrectly listed as 18, and she claimed to be a widow. I guess this was to explain the pregnancy, because it, she couldn't say that it was James's. But after they were married, she had a miscarriage. Pretty soon thereafter, she was pregnant again, and had a girl called Dana. It's like they wanted a boy, and then had the name Dan all picked out. And then it was a girl, so it was like... And soon thereafter, they had another child, a boy, named Troy. These names are lazy for very different reasons. Sharon seemed to control the finances in the home, and she would spend a ton of money. They would argue a lot about finances, because despite getting them into debt and lying about paying bills, she still wanted a flashy new car, specifically a Ford Thunderbird, and she wanted to go on lavish vacations. And she was cheating on James on top of everything with an old high school friend named John. James suspected this infidelity and he wanted a divorce, but his very religious parents didn't approve of this plan and kind of talked him out of it, so he tried to make the marriage work. Sharon also wanted out of the marriage, but she had a slightly different strategy. She offered her boyfriend John money to kill her husband. John said no, but he kept seeing her. Some would say your lover trying to hire you as a hitman could be a red flag, but those people are smart, and John, well, he was not. James eventually couldn't take it anymore, According to his relatives, he planned to file for divorce on Monday the 21st of March, 1960. But James would never see the 21st, because on March the 19th, the police got a call from Sharon. James was dead. He had been shot in the back of the head while napping. And the killer was Dana, their two-year-old daughter. The police thought this was a plausible story. They said they couldn't disprove the theory, even though they didn't even bother to check for gun residue on Sharon or Dana's hands, which um, was really the very least they could have done, and which could have disproven the theory. Imagine this logic. Hey boss, I need to take two weeks off. 
I have COVID. Okay, well, this is pretty inconvenient. How do you know you have COVID? Well, I can't disprove that I have COVID. Well, did you take a test? Nope. Okay, seems legit. Get well soon. The police also overlooked that at the time, the newspapers were full of a story of a woman in Virginia named Lillian Chastain, who was, surprise, surprise, charged with her husband's murder just a month earlier, after claiming that he had been accidentally shot by none other than their two-year-old daughter. Bunch of killer toddlers out there, man. It's like children of the corn. Maybe they just didn't like their names either. Or maybe their mothers are murdering sociopaths. Soon after, Sharon used James's life insurance policy payout to buy herself her dream Ford Thunderbird. And while she was at the dealership, she thought she'd pick up a little something else for herself. A new boyfriend, to be specific. To add to her growing collection, because John was still in the picture. This new guy actually owned the car dealership, and his name was Walter. But Walter was already married to his high school sweetheart, a woman named Patricia. Sharon thought he could be her next husband, but Walter just kind of wanted a side piece, and he had no intention of actually leaving Patricia. So Sharon decided to give him a little nudge. Hey, hope you're good. By the way, got a bun in the oven and you're the father. Okay, bye. But instead of dumping his wife, Walter dumped Sharon. And she did not like that, not one bit. So she went to go see Patricia to tell her that her husband was having an affair. Patricia was a little bit skeptical when she got the call, so she took a friend with her to this meeting. But Sharon asked if she could speak to Patricia in private. And Patricia went reluctantly. And then poof, Patricia vanished. She was reported missing by Walter, who was very concerned, and he suspected that Sharon had something to do with it. He met up with Sharon and demanded to know where Patricia was, but Sharon insisted that she had dropped Patricia off unharmed. Sharon, very sulky, then wanted some comfort and took her other boyfriend, John, to a secluded lover's lane for some canoodling. And while they were canoodling, they were rudely interrupted, by Patricia's dead body, which Sharon just happened to come across. She made John call the cops to report it, and also told him to lie and say that he had found it alone. But unbeknownst to John, Sharon had staged the body to look like a sex crime had taken place. So of course, the police were instantly suspicious of John. But luckily, when he broke down and told the truth, they believed him. So they then started doubting her original story about the death of her husband and ended up charging Sharon with Patricia's murder and with James's murder. She went on trial and she was acquitted of Patricia's murder. She had a lot of support in the community. They even signed a petition and when she was acquitted, there was applause in the courtroom. So she was obviously a very convincing liar. But they also didn't have a very strong case because they didn't have the murder weapon, a 22 caliber gun, and they also hadn't bothered to do a proper autopsy due to mistakes being made. But then, her next trial, she wasn't so lucky. John testified against her um, about, for example, her trying to hire him as a hitman, and she ended up being found guilty of James's murder. However, she had a very good attorney because her mother worked at one of the top law firms as a legal secretary and uh, she called in a favor. And the law firm also had mafia connections, so people didn't really want to mess with them. Lots of corruption. So she appealed and got a new trial. She would end up getting four trials because there was just misstep after misstep. Her fourth trial date was set for October of 1964, but she decided not to be around for that. She had met a new guy called Samuel, and in September they went to Mexico, supposedly to get married. She traveled under a fake name, already pretending to be his wife. Once they arrived in Mexico, Sharon went to a bar one night without Samuel. She met a man who was a Mexican-born American and went back to his motel room with him. 
Once there, she shot him twice in the heart, and then she tried to flee, but the motel was locked. So she tried to demand the manager open it, but shot him when he wouldn't unlock it. However, he survived and managed to wrestle the gun away from her, and then he held her up at gunpoint until the police arrived. So she was stuck in Mexico in jail, and according to reporters, uh, she was visited by an American embassy representative who then claimed that she said that she had killed men before and gotten away with it. They found the gun that killed Patricia in her possession along with another weapon. She was then charged in Mexico with homicide and attempted homicide. She, however, claimed that she had acted in self-defense. But they didn't buy her story, and they sentenced her to 10 years. And then they extended that sentence to 13 years when she tried to appeal, because she showed no remorse. She only served a few years, however, because on 7 December of 1969, Sharon was found missing during a daily roll call in prison. But she was only reported missing at 2 a.m. the next day which smells a little bit like corruption and bribery to me, but that's not proven, it's just my opinion. And Sharon has never been seen again. If she is still alive, she would be in her 80s today. And that is the story of Sharon Kinney. It's wild, and it sucks that she didn't really get punished for the horrible thing she did. Imagine blaming that on your daughter and your daughter having to grow up thinking that. It's really terrible. But that's the end of the story and the end of this video. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you for subscribing and for supporting the channel. I really appreciate it. And I will see you next time. Bye.